This is Roger Sacolato, and I'll be talking about the FIMS Repository Interface Implementation Guideline, Section 8, Adding Content and Essence. Today we're going to cover the objectives of uh, adding content and essence to an asset repository, and as such, this webinar will describe the basic operations that can be used to accomplish that goal. And as far as key concepts, we're going to be covering ID generation, content operations, essence operations, and storage accessibility. It is recommended that the webinar sections 1 through 7 are watched before watch this webinar. There will be some uh, good background material that will uh, be important and uh, fill in a lot of the uh, motivations for uh, what's being described in this webinar. So this uh, presentation will be done from the client or user point of view. Um, there will be uh, some information that can be useful for uh, implementers, but primarily will be for uh, the user side. And uh, we're going to be uh, covering the sort of what the operations are, some basic requirements, and some important notions. For example, the difference between synchronous and asynchronous operations, um, how to deal with error results, and also what the essence placeholder is. So as an overview, uh, let's talk about content, essence, and orchestration. So in general, a FIMS repository service provides a standard interface to an asset repository. Uh, also be thought of anything from uh, a digital asset management system uh, to a, uh, you know, a sort of uh, small-ish small scale video server um, to even uh, just a, a file system uh, that's acting as some sort of archive. Um, so at, this is a repository of assets. Assets themselves are media objects with a common structure shared by all of our services. And this is the BM content, which will be described uh, later in the webinar. Um, assets uh, have identifiers. Uh, they have content, which is uh, metadata, and they have essence. And these are media files. And so uh, content is really the abstract and physical representation of multimedia essence. What that means is the abstract part of this is the sort of uh, metadata aspect descriptions, you know, what this content is about, who created it, when was it created. The physical representation uh, includes things like the formats of the essence, uh, what the, the compression or encoding is, uh, you know, how many tracks, um, and also location. Uh, which is you know where where are these files stored in a, in a storage system? Where can they be found? Uh, one important thing to note is that content does not require essence. It it can just exist by itself as as the abstract representation. Um, but essence does require content. It, it essence is not addressable by itself. It has to be referenced through content. So, content versus essence. Uh, content is initially stored as a BM content type object. As mentioned, this, this is the sort of standard FIMS representation for um, a content object or an asset. Um, essence is uploaded to the repository after the content is uh, created. And as such, the, the, the sort of format and the located, these are those uh, physical representations of the essence, the content format and the essence locator objects are added to the content record. Uh, what's important to know here is that multiple instances of essence can be uploaded to the same asset. So for example, we start with uh, asset creation where a BM content type is, is added to the repository. No, no essence yet, it's just by itself. Now we do an essence upload where we uh, create a content format type and essence locator type. Um, create the essence record up in the repository um, and we can repeat that operation and a, a, the standard example for this is high resolution essence or th for broadcast and uh, proxy or low resolution essence for browsing and this this can be repeated you know over and over again so uh, there was a mention of orchestration uh, thing to notice here is that the operations involved in uh, asset, content and essence for assets, it, it's a multiple or complex tra uh, transaction. So orchestration is the coordination of these multiple operations to affect that compound transaction. Um, for the purposes of this webinar, because that's a really broad topic, 
um, orchestration is really the combination of content and essence operations on a single asset. Now normally um, orchestration uh, can be done by a, a dedicated orchestration engine uh, running a business process uh, software system um, that's scripted through a, a you know language like a business process language or, or something like that. Uh, but that's not necessary. The, it, the operations can be executed and managed by uh, code in a client application. So um, in order to manage the, uh, the multiple operations though, whether it, it be an uh, application or an engine, the orchestration client must keep track of the asset ID. That's the sort of the key that joins uh, all the elements of the operation together, uh, whether it be creating the content or uploading essence. So let's talk about adding content and start off by saying that content in the context of this webinar is a single time-based element representing a bounded, bounded contiguous stream. Bounded meaning uh, in to out, you know, start recording, stop recording is typically uh, how content is created. Um, and it's a contiguous stream, which means it's, it's, there's no gaps or missing pieces. Uh, and it's audio, video, and or data samples. Um, Data samples includes things like uh, vertical interval time code or closed captioning. Together, uh, the, 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 this representation is commonly called a clip. Now, content is normally associated with essence files, but doesn't have to be, as mentioned previously. So, regarding IDs, so all content must be uniquely identified when added to the repository. The format for FIMS of this unique identifier is a GUID, which is encoded as a string, and this is a standard um, expression, standard encoding method. So the value of the identifier can be created by the repository, there's a function called generate unique ID, or it can be created by the client. Identifiers can then be used to get information from the repository with a get content call. Um, now, identifiers do not have to align with the essence. For example, if you have a material, uh, an MXF file with a material source ID, that material source ID is a format that's specific to MXF. It's a SMPTE Universal Media uh, Material Identification, UMID. Um, so that, that's okay as it is. Uh, the, the, the unique identifier, the GUID that we're involved in here is a FIMS ID. And um, we can connect those to the native IDs that are in the essence, and, and that way the repository can you know, map from one ID to a different one. But in our context, identifiers are stored as resource IDs in BM content objects. As mentioned before, the, this unique ID is a FIMS ID and does not have to be, say, the primary key in the backing repository. So uh, as an instance, if, if an MXF uh, file is added, uh, it's typical that the uh, material package ID is also the ID of the content. This doesn't have to be the case for the FIMS interface. So here's an example. We have a FIMS repository service and a native asset management system that's in back of the service. Uh, so the, uh, the client can create, uh, can add a content with an ID of X. The native asset could have an ID of Y and create a, an attribute, say, called FIMS ID, which is the FIMS value X. Now, when you're retrieving a content object, the ID mapping is done in reverse. So you do get content for X. That calls a query to say, get me the asset where FIMS ID equals X. You find that asset, you load it, and you convert it into a FIMS uh, BM content object where the B FIMS ID is X and the original native asset ID of Y is, is available as a description. Okay, so <clears throat> talking about new BM content objects or the instantiation of a BM content objects object uh, to add to a repository, uh, that they're mostly descriptions. They don't uh, typically have formats or technical metadata at the beginning because um, the essence hasn't been uploaded yet and as the technical metadata is really identified or associated with essence. So um, it's mostly descriptions. Uh, the BM content does inherit from resource type and under that uh, the ID is stored uh, in the resource reference type. 
Um, description values themselves are derived from EBU Core. If you look in the documentation, you'll see the uh, various uh, description properties uh, that are available to be added to the content. Um, and it, at a level, FIMS does provide an extension mechanism. There's two main mechanisms. There's extension attributes, which is a very simple mechanism, and there's an extension group. This is a much more complex mechanism, but it's much more capable of uh, adding more complexity than what's available in the extension attributes. So for custom content, because the, uh, the description part is pretty easy, uh, to add custom values you can use an existing field of a BM content description type, for example identifier or description, and you specify a type definition string to identify you know, what the, the sort of key for the value is. What it was its customization. Extension groups is more difficult but allows for an arbitrary extension, not just one that is uh, uh, stored in the description section uh, of the content object. Um, custom XML elements can be added but must be declared in an XSD document, which means you have to have a schema for it. And uh, you can generate software from the schema so that parsers, etc., uh, can then hook themselves into that schema and, and uh, parse it automatically. Uh, and in that case, uh, it's likely that the XNT XSD file uh, needs to be imported. So here's a code example, a little background uh, for the code example. Um, one way to get uh, a reference implementation uh, started is if you program in Java is to generate Java source classes from the WSDL and XSD files that come with the uh, FIMS 1.1 uh, distribution. Um, to do this you can run a, the Apache CXF application or script WSDL to Java uh, and you run it on the repository WSDL file that's the top level file uh, and that's going to create Java code. Now you can create the directory for the output with the minus D option, and this does create the full SOAP uh, structure. So it'll create the, uh, the request messages and responses and basically set you up so that all you have to do is hook up these objects to a SOAP infrastructure, for example, CXF. Um, but in this case, the parameter object types, for example, add content request type and some of the core types uh, in the, uh, the BMS core, those can also be used for REST web services. Uh, and these objects are annotated for XML serialization, deserialization versus via Jaxby, which means that uh, you don't even have to uh, manually parse the objects. Uh, you can just use the Jaxby code to marshal and unmarshal uh, from the objects to strings and vice versa. So uh, using, uh, in this example, uh, the Apache CXF version 2.6.2, uh, if you look at the bin calling the wisdle 2 javabatch script on Windows, uh, there's two options, a client option and a server option. Um, the minus D for the client is Java client. For the server, it's just Java. Uh, and then you run it on the repository dash v1 underscore one underscore zero dot wisdle, and uh, you get your Java objects. So here, uh, using these Java objects in uh, Java code, uh, we can create a new content object by creating uh, a variable of BM content type. Now we can set the resource ID on that content by generating, in this case, uh, our own UID. We're not going to call the generate unique ID here, uh, but you can use the UUID class in Java that conforms to the GUID structure and the string format is compatible. So now I'm going to build a description. So um, I build the BM content description type uh, and that's where I'm going to hang all my metadata. So um, if you look at the, your, your, your EBU core descriptions, they're all their own classes that subclass from the, from the description uh, base class. So I'm going to uh, establish a title type because I want to say I want to say what the title is. So I establish I create a variable of title type, set the value to the title, and now I add it to, the content description. Now you notice that the way they do that is get title add, and that's because uh, according to the schema uh, that the, uh, the there can be multiple descriptions of any kind. So there can be multiple title descriptions, multiple descriptions in general, multiple identifiers. And so the um, 
the value there is a list. And so content description is built with an empty list. You get the title to get the list, and then you add the title to the list. So that explains you know, how that, why that code is structured the way it is. Um, now we're going to try uh, show how to create an attribute extension. So I'm going to create a description type. I call it custom description. Um, and I'm going to set the value to my custom value. And then I'm going to set the type definition. This is a default uh, optional uh, call. It's, it's only needed if you have a, an override or a custom value. And the type definition is just my custom key. And so now when you pop open that definition, you can use the type definition to understand, oh, this is my key, and therefore I know how to understand how that value should be applied, what it means, what it's for, what its, what its structure is or syntax, or how to parse it if it needs parsing. And so, and so now I build uh, the description uh, type. Uh, it needs a, an ID. It's not used. I just generated a random ID. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, set the content description I built before to this description type. And then I'm going to eventually, if you notice that the last line is to uh, set that to the content. So this is an example of how to uh, build descriptions and add them to content. So now the BM content is created. We can add it to a content request object and call the service add content endpoint. And this is for SOAP. The alternate method is REST if you're dealing with a REST implementation where you uh, pass a BM content object to the HTTP um, within the HTTP content field. It's confusing because it's content and content. The HTTP content is just the body of the request. Uh, it's shown here using some Java uh, code using the REST Easy REST uh, framework. So the first line, uh, creating a content object of content type, and I and, and you know say I don't show it here, but let's say that that is built up. Now I build my REST uh, call. Uh, eventually, uh, I get to the uh, response equals target request. I'm building a request for HTTP. Uh, I'm going to identify that I accept XML. I'm going to post an entity, which is a, an object. And uh, the content here is the content I built up. This represents the asset. And its format is X application XML. And so now I'm going to get a response back. Which now brings us to how do we handle results. Um, this is a synchronous call. So a successful result returns the result data immediately. So we're going to get a copy of the resultant BM content object directly in the response. Now in SOAP, it's in an add contents response type object. In REST, it's in the response body. The result of the HTTP call has a response body. It's going to contain the XML for the BM content object. Now this represents the, the what we call the fully hydrated BM content object, including any metadata that has to be added uh, by the repository service. So this is really the the resultant BM content object that uh, is, is the result of creating uh, the, the creation of that asset. And so here's a, an example where um, following on that REST code, if the uh, result is uh, 200 HTTP OK success, um, I can get the content type out by reading the entity and mapping it to a BM content type class and then reclosing the response uh, uh, shuts down the connection. For error cases in both SOAP and REST app implementations, an error result eventually returns a repository fault type object. SOAP wraps it in a repository fault message. Um, in REST, it's returned in the response body. Uh, and inside that fault type object is an, is, our error, is an error code, detailed error codes or extended error codes, and other uh, inner details uh, that, that can give, you, give the client application information about why uh, the um, request failed. And if that's presented to the user at some level, the, uh, if it's a correctable problem, then a recovery strategy can be implemented and, and dealt with. 
So now we've kind of handled content. Let's go to essence. Um, let's do the overview here. Uh, so now that content has been established in the repository, essence can be added to that content. Now, the important part here is that all essence that's added to that content should contain the same sounds and images, i.e., be the same material. The, as mentioned previously, the probably the most popular example is is having high resolution and proxy formats of a clip. The the thing here is that one only one format can be added in a single add essence operation. So even though you want to add two, you have to add the high resolution, then add the proxy. An important concept here, as mentioned way back at the beginning, is accessible storages. So in order to upload Essence files, the client and the repository must both have access to a common storage location. This is sort of the, the handoff point where the upload service writes files, the client service writes files, or the client application writes files, and the repository can read them. Now there, this is the responsibility of the repository in terms of setting it up and identifying that location. The client can query that location via the RCR. Once the add essence call is made, the repository then owns that essence file because it's responsible for that storage. The, the repository service can choose to leave the essence files there until they're deleted through the delete essence call, or it can copy the essence to a different storage and then remove those uh, sort of transient essence files once the, uh, the transaction is finished. In either case, the, all the essence must be managed. Once the add essence call is made, the responsibility of those files is uh, for the uh, is, is by the repository service. Okay, so here's an example. We have a client, we have a repository, uh, we have a common storage, we have a private storage for the repository. Uh, the client gets from the repository a general capability using the get general capability call. The uh, parameter here is supported source locations. Client then copies essence to one of those source locations. And uh, once the add essence is done, the repository can choose to use it in place or copy it to the private storage. Again, in any case, it's up to the repository to uh, clean up after itself once the uh, the essence is no longer needed, either because it's been copied into private storage or because the user has deleted it. So to build an add essence request, there are three main things to consider. You have to have a content object. This identifies to the repository what content the format should be associated with. A format object describing the format of the essence. And an essence locator object describing the actual essence files as stored in the commonly accessible storage system. Now the format, there, it, it's, there's a little bit of uh, complexity to specifying the format, uh, only that uh, the tech, this is, and the format is all basically technical metadata. It can either be added to the add essence request by the client, or it can be added via the processing of the essence files. In other words, the repository can open up the essence file pull or deduce or somehow copy the technical metadata out of the essence file and then establish it into the repository, into the associated with the content object through the BM content format type. Uh, there is a way to find out whether or not the client needs to um, add the, the format or, it, or the, whether the, uh, uh, the repository service will compute it. There's an RCR general capability called Format Profile Metadata Processing Type. It's an enumeration which says that the client must supply the format, the server will compute the format, or the server will compute the format if the client doesn't provide it. So in any case, if the provider computes the BM content format type, then the client can omit the value. And see the documentation for details. So what is the BM content format type? It defines a collection of subformats, one for each of video, audio, and data. And these uh, are the, the uh, you know, identify what kind of video and detail aspects of the video or the audio or the data. For data is, for example, 
uh, vertical interval data or closed captioning or things like that. So the format type, you'll notice if you look through the specification, you'll also notice that the format type contains essence locators. These are really for already uploaded essence for that format. Um, it, it may be, for example, that the uh, essence exists in multiple locations within the asset repository, for example, on an R online system or, and or uh, on nearline slash offline systems, for example, archives. So um, the client can query the uh, format type, can, can do a query on the a content, look at the content format type and see if there's an essence locator field to see if there's uh, essence there. You may have an essence a format type without an essence locator. Now the last part is the essence locator, which is to describe where in the commonly accessible storage system the, the essence files are. The uh, BM essence locator, which is the type of the parameter to the add essence uh, operation, uh, is a base class. Clients need to supply the appropriate subclass of the locator. There are three, simple file locator, list file locator, and folder locator. See the documentation for the details. Um, they're pretty self-evident. Simple file is a single file. List file is a list of individual files, and a folder is just a path where everything under the path needs to be uploaded. Again, all locators must reference the paths on the commonly accessible storage systems. Okay, so now we have all the data. How can we start the add essence and tell when it finishes? So unlike add content, add essence is an asynchronous operation requiring a callback to receive status and result data. The callback mechanism is not used, i.e. the client does not provide callback information to the, to the request, then the client really can't know the result of the operation. There will be no way to connect a request with a result. Clients must use the reply to and fault to parameters to establish these callback endpoints. And for REST, like for, for SOAP, it's just the SOAP endpoint. For REST, it's the base URL. Once the content, format, and locator are added to the add essence request object, the add essence call can be made. And now, because this is an asynchronous operation, it returns an operation ACK or a fault object if it fails. Now, even though it's asynchronous, it can fail immediately if there's an internal um, issue with the repository that would cause an uh, uh, instant failure. For example, uh, that uh, there's, there's some internal component that's inoperable if the system is in an error state. Uh, there could be a number of reasons why the uh, add essence request would fail even before processing the information. If the, if the operation is successfully submitted to the, the mechanism within the repository, the queuing mechanism, then the result will be an ACK, an op essence operation ACK object. And this acknowledgment, the ACK is for acknowledgment, contains a timestamp and an operation ID. Now this ID is used to correlate the request with whatever comes out of the request, i.e. result or fault. So here's an example of the, the flow here, where we have the client in the repository, and the client has implemented a callback port, either in SOAP or REST. First thing that happens is a connection is made to the repository. So we're making an add essence request, and we're getting back an operation ACK, with including the operation ID. Now this just means that the repository has accepted the transaction, but doesn't say anything about when that transaction will finish. At some point in the future, there will be a notification to the callback port, either a response notification or a fault notification. In either case, there will be an operation ID attached to that notification, which the client can then use to uh, match that to the request and then uh, be able to, to know if that request is finished. To cancel an upload, you have to use the operation ID returned in the ACK for the corresponding add essence call, and then call cancel add essence. So 
the client makes an ad essence call, gets the operation ID back, and now wants to cancel. It calls cancel ad essence and then hands in that operation ID. Now, <coughs> the cancel call is asynchronous because it may be complicated to execute that operation. There, there may be different subsystems that have to be uh, coordinated in order to uh, process it. And it's because typically, even internally to these uh, repository services, it's a multi-stage operation where you know first files have to be moved and then uh, metadata has to be coordinated and checked in. Results have to make it back to the FIM service. So, th so there may be an orchestration, a sub-orchestration within the repository service. So uh, it's important not to block that result synchronously and, and, and cause the client to have to wait uh, some possibly, you know, long time for that cancel call. So cancel acknowledges itself, and then through the callback mechanism, the cancel itself will be uh, either successful, in which case uh, the cancel will have been implemented, the upload will not have taken place, and all the media, the essence, has, will have been deleted. Uh, or you'll get a fault back which says that the cancel could not have been executed, most likely because it, the upload had already finished and it couldn't be undone. Um, so, <clears throat> finishing off on the callback, when the operation either fails or finishes, a message is sent to either the reply to or the fault to endpoint. So if it's a success, you'll get an add essence operation notification type object sent to wherever the reply to was is, is established. In case of failure, you'll, you'll get a fault notification type object. And that will be sent to the fault to endpoint. And either, either the reply or the fault objects will contain the operation ID that was returned from the corresponding add essence response. So the Ad Essence Operation Notification Type, this is the long name for the result. So now we have the result object sent to the reply to endpoint will contain a new BM content object reflecting both the format and the locator for the new Essence. And that will show the final path of the Essence files in case the repository service moves the content or the Essence files from the commonly accessible location to the um, private internal location. And finally, uh, we have error cases um, where you get the fault notification type. As with the synchronous faults, the uh, information or the, the object will contain an error code along with other details. See documentation for details, for specifics. Okay, so now that the essence, uh, we've talked about adding essence and adding content, there's this, oh, one more concept to cover, which is called placeholders. Now, in some scenarios, it's useful to sort of pre-register an essence that is being created. And so, for example, during transcode or ingest or recover from archive, the knowledge that essence is in process can let other software components know not to create redundant copies. And this is, this is useful where you have automation coming in from maybe multiple different fronts, multiple users ask for the same content to be restored from, from an archive system. Well, in this case, that you the once the first request was made, and now uh, the arc it has to be returned retrieved from archive and put in the commonly accessible storage location before the upload can start. Um, the client software can put a placeholder, can can register. A, uh, an object to uh, notify the system, hey, there's going to be essence coming for this uh, content. And it's going to say what the format is. It, it has to provide the format. Um, and that way, other clients can, when they query the repository to find out, hey, is there essence available for this format, they will see the placeholder and realize that media is, is, is in process of, of being uploaded uh, and that it's, it's probably not necessary to do the same operation itself. So that's sort of the, the, the motivation for why uh, the placeholder has value. So t in technical terms, it's a content format object without any essence files. So in step one, 
you call the add essence placeholder providing this content format the function returns a placeholder object now the the uh, material is being uh, recovered or so what in, in any case made available on the on the uh, accessible storage when that is ready the client can then add, call add essence passing in the returned placeholder from the call in step one when that happens the um, repository service will change the format object when the upload is finished to uh, change its location from a placeholder location to a uh, real location uh, and that's the important part of the placeholder it knows from the placeholder which format to change rather than creating a new format which would end up uh, then you'd have to manage manually deleting the placeholder essence uh, so you don't have extra objects uh, in the system. Well that does it for this section. Uh, this is the FIMS Repository Interface Implementation Guideline Section 8 Adding Content and Essence. The next implementation guideline will be Section 9 Retrieving and Managing Content and Essence.